Hey guys, Captain Foley here to tell you that I was sitting around the house the other day, bored out of my mind, so I decided to write this episode. And it's all about cubes. Like this one. No, not, not that one. Like this one? Ooh. Well, actually, this one might be more dangerous if you open it. But no, how about this one? Borg cubes. That's what we're gonna do. Alex Samuel's got one. Yeah. Guys, I am Commander Cockins, and you heard the captain's terrible, terrible, terrible jokes. Unfortunately, with him writing the script, resistance to these jokes is futile for us all. I'm so sorry. Anyway, today we are doing a Borg ship, the most famous Borg ship to be exact. That's right. You will lower your defenses, and we will instruct you and teach you. Our collective knowledge will be assimilated by your brain, and you will be much more educated on the topic of today's discussion, the Borg Cube. But that's not all. We have a very special guest and presenter joining us for this episode today. Allow me to welcome Manu Interami, a former Borg drone and our resident Borg expert, back to the show. Welcome back, Manu. Hey, guys. Uh, I don't really know what would be more dangerous, honestly, the, the Borg cube or the Hellraiser cube. Um, I don't know which one I'd rather go up against if I, 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 mean, I could think about that. But uh, I, I guess uh, I'm here and I am the resident Borg expert. I, I still am half Borg. Uh, for those of you out there that believe in uh, the ship exists, um, I guess you guys just couldn't resist having me back, could you? I could. I suppose you could say that resistance was futile, so to speak. You just <laughs> had to have me join you in making some really bad puns here, huh? So it's okay. There is a 95% probability that you had to ask me to join you to discuss the most iconic Borg ship of all time, the Borg Cube. It is my honor to be back here on Trek Yards to do just that. So without further delay, let's get right into it and allow your viewers to assimilate some very interesting information. <sighs> Thanks, Manu. You're welcome. So let's start off by giving you the measurements of this ship. As we tend to do here on Trek Yards, this ship is 3,040 meters. Well, cubed. All the sides are the exact same dimensions. Although because of the constant assimilation of encountered tech, each cube may be different in exact measurements. But the general cube dimensions remain about the same, with each side being equal to the other sides. It is thought to have around 1,700, that's 1,700 decks, and according to Memory Alpha, a complement of up to 130,000 drones. Although Memory Beta says a total of 640,000 drones, which is very substantially different. And last, she has an internal volume of 27 cubic kilometers inside of the cube. All critical systems are evenly distributed throughout the entirety of the ship, which provides substantial redundancies in case of damage or failure of key systems. Armament for these vessels include, but are not necessarily limited to, cutting beams, plasma beams and projectile weaponry, magnetomedic guided charges, missiles, tractor beams, focused neutron banks, shield depletion pulses, numerous tractor beam emitters, and about 36 adaptive weapons arrays. However, it should be noted that as ships assimilate other ships and races into the collective, additional weapons or specific armaments can be added or upgraded, so no two Borg cubes are exactly identical in any way. The standard attack method of the Borg cube is a high-energy or a specialist warp-capable energy weapon to drain the target vessel's shields and also to disrupt the warp field of any target moving at warp speed. Then after the target has dropped to sublight speed and its shields are sufficiently drained, the cube begins to cut up the vessel into smaller pieces using its cutting beam. Uh, sort of like one of those slicers at a deli. It cuts up the turkey and you, then you put it on a sandwich. These smaller sections which have been extracted from the enemy vessels are then taken inside of the Borg cube, sandwich style, where the technology is analyzed and then broken down and processed by nanites. Sort of like your stomach's... Uh, um, you know, um, the things in your stomach that break down food, as well as by drones. You found the analogy of the modern day. Perfect. I should have said that in the show. <laughs> the raw elements are then immediately adapted and reconfigured to integrate with the Borg cube, enhancing its capabilities almost instantly. Next, the Borg may fire an assimilation beam consisting of millions of nanites at the enemy ship, allowing the we beasties to begin assimilating the ship directly. It's at this time the drones also transport over and continue the process from the ship's interior. However, if the ship is still thought to be a direct threat to the collective, then the cunning beam or plaza weapons are used to destroy the remainder of the vessel once shields are down. Some of the defenses employed by Borg cubes have included various forms of force fields, including subspace fields. 
and several electromagnetic fields. Cubes also use dispersal fields to disrupt sensor and transporter functions of enemy ships. However, the Borg themselves were very capable of transporting through most shield systems themselves. The cubes also utilize regenerative shielding. This adaptive shielding system is very hard to circumvent, and overcoming them for any extended period of time to cause sufficient damage to destroy a cube is almost impossible. Many techniques have been imagined over the years to counter this technology, such as weapons which modulate their fire rates, frequencies, and discharges. However, these have been met with limited success at best. It is believed that the suggested weak spot of Picard's focus fire on in first contact may have been a waste extraction element, and assuming that you do manage to cause noticeable damage to a cube, it can still be operational and extremely deadly, even if 80% of it is completely destroyed. Even if the vessel's main functions do fail due to heavy damage, the nanotechnology-based repair systems will continue to rebuild the damaged systems and structures. Almost every encounter with a Borg cube or cubes results in heavy losses. Borg cubes were capable of both warp and transwarp velocities thanks in part to the Borg Collective's network of transwarp corridors and hubs. When a Borg cube enters a transwarp conduit, it projects a structural integrity field ahead of itself to compensate for the extreme gravimetric shear. To compensate for the extreme temporal stress while traveling through these corridors and remain in temporal sync, a chroniton field is also projected through a specially designed conduits. A Borg's maximum warp factor appears to be greater than a Galaxy-class starship, as the first Borg cube encountered by the Enterprise kept gaining on them despite their best efforts to outrun it. It is known, however, that multiple warp field conduits are capable of propelling the cube in any direction at a cruising speed of warp 8 and likely top speed of warp 9.999, which would allow the vessel to travel 7,000 light years in one calendar year. We have no idea, however, how long the ship could maintain these top warp speeds. At least one Borg cube and possibly others of its class contained a Borg sphere. The only known recorded purpose of a sphere disengaging from a cube was for escape of the Queen. The sphere is the only documented support vehicle a Borg cube is known to possess, but it is speculated that ships up to the size of a standard sphere were able to be docked within a Borg cube for assimilation purposes. It is possible that the ship is reconfigurable as needed due to use of the nanites. I always, uh, I referred to those Borg spheres as Borg balls. I also got, uh reprimanded a set, at a convention. You a set of your own, eh? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, the interior of Borg cubes were highly decentralized in structure with no specific bridge or engineering sections. As mentioned earlier, all vital systems were spread throughout the ship, which, along with the presence of its regenerative hull, made it highly resistant to damage and system failures. The infrastructure was made up of titanium and an alloy known for its extreme hardness. Some Borg vessels were even equipped with maturation chambers for any assimilated babies or juveniles. We have one here today. Where'd you put him? We ate the Borg baby on the show. Did you ever notice that Borg baby just disappeared? <laughs> mm -hmm. We yeah, assimilated yeah. it with our stomachs. <clears throat> Information and collective communications were rerouted through power waveguides and distribution nodes. The exterior design consisted of perpendicular and diagonal grids, grids, struts, and weaponry, allowing a characteristic green light to emanate from within. The internal pressure aboard a Borg cube was 2 kilopascals above what would be normal on a Federation starship. The humidity was on average 92%, and the temperature was 39.1 Celsius. And the atmosphere contained traces of tetrion particles. 92% humidity and 39.1 degrees Celsius sounds like summer here in Ontario. <laughs> Pretty much. Borg Central. The first officially publicized Federation contact with the Borg Cube took place in 2365 when the Enterprise D, under the command of Jean Luc Picard, encountered a single cube in the system J25 due to the interference of an entity known only as Q. However, Civilian researchers on board the USS Raven had previously tracked a Borg cube 12 years earlier in 2353 to the Delta Quadrant. Millions of Borg cubes are estimated to exist within Borg space in the Delta Quadrant, as it is their home quadrant. Are you, millions? Millions yes. in both quadrants? Millions of Borg cubes. That's yes. something you would not want to see. By the year 2377, the Collective had developed a way to join 
eight cubes together to form a single large vehicle called a fusion cube, as seen in the game Star Trek Armada II. Additional armor plating was later added to standard cubes to create tactical cubes, or given their full designation class four tactical vessel. Compared to a regular cube, the most notable additions were her extensive hull armor over critical systems and the majority of the ship along with a more de dedicated weapon arrays. The interior was also slightly altered from the known Borg architecture. The central plexus was protected. Well, I, I always protect my central plexus, so that, that does make sense. The vessel's central plexus was protected by multi-regenerative security fields. Tactical cubes could also be combined to form tactical fusion cubes. To build either of these versions of fusion cubes, you first need to build a fusion hub. Once the hub was functional, eight cubes then placed themselves in careful formation and fused together. Tactical fusion cubes had a crew of thousands, were heavily armored and had powerful shielding, making them one of the most powerful vessels in all of Trek, and could easily outgun and even overpower a starbase. The original tactical cubes were designed by Doug Drexler and used in games such as Star Trek Legacy, Star Trek Armada 2, Star Trek Conquest, and of course Star Trek Online. In Star Trek Online, the ship is classed as a dreadnought, while all the other games classed as merely a cruiser. Now let's talk a little about behind the scenes aspects of the physical model. Uh, in the final draft of the script for Q-Who, it is described as such. The shape of the ship is more apparent. It's box-like, with none of the aerodynamic qualities associated with most spaceships, including the Enterprise. This is a case of form following function. The original concept for the Borg Cube was conceived by writer-producer Maurice Hurley and designed by production designer Richard James. Yeah, there's not uh, a lot of aerodynamic quality in a cube. Yep. Uh, I tried to race a cube out on the track once. It didn't work out for, for me. <laughs> well. But hey, third place isn't bad. Yeah, mm. it's okay. I, I did place. I mean, I finished. Uh, the original <laughs> studio model was built from the simple embellishments that Rick Sternbach, who is also half Borg, uh, the other half minion, um, and Richard James had created based on the description of the cubicle ship given in the script. Due to the regular model builder, Greg Jean, being busy with Star Trek V, the responsibility of building the model fell to Kim Bailey of Starlight Effects. This was essentially a scratch-built model assembled layer by layer from custom shapes created by union model makers to make the inner surface. It was then covered with hand-drawn acid etched brass designs which created the intricate surface details in multiple layers when it was lit from within. The final weight of the finished model came at astounding 60 pounds. This three foot model was used in Q Who, the best of both worlds and the emissary. Due to its shape, no more than three sides of the cube would be seen at any given time on screen, yet the model was fully detailed on five sides with the sixth side being left open allowing for the adjustments of interior lighting. Many other models of various sizes were constructed for other episodes using styrene sprue. Styrene sprue pieces, yes. Styrene sprue. I used to know a girl named uh, Styrene sprue back in high school. Um, and even things like paper clips placed sporadically throughout, the most detailed of which appeared in First Contact and to the motion picture level of detail, which still looks fantastic today, especially on Blu-ray. Those, those movies do hold out. Eventually, yeah. a totally CG version was constructed and used in Voyager, starting with the Season 3 uh, finale, Scorpion Part 1, which started off Voyager's many interactions with the Borg. This CG version at the time had to be built and used very cleverly by the team at Foundation Imaging, since the amount of detail and the sort of shots chosen when they're only the sides visible could have any interactive lighting to ensure the scenes could even be rendered on time. And for many of these shots, any physical detail was removed entirely from these unseen sides. The first Borg cube made for Scorpion was finished in April 1997 and was 138,603 polygons and had a 64 light setup. Skip to the final cube model used in 2001, which had 183,525 polygons and now only 44 lights in the scene. For reference, the USS Voyager high res hero model had 278,352 polygons, the Equinox was 130,071 polygons, and Prometheus had 97,521. Well, and to make sure that we give you all the facts we can, the Borg Tactical Cube is 192,600 
and 73,486 12 points. 978 uh, degrees um, inverted. Um, where am I here? And to make sure we give you all the facts we can, the Borg tactical cube is 192,737 polygons, and Borg diamond, the queen's personal craft, 510,825 polygons, which compared to the best Borg cube model at 183,525 polygons, as Stuart said, if you heard him closely, if you listened, uh, shows that they really put the extra detail into that specific model. We can thank Brandon McDougall for that model, and she is a beauty. Now, there is one thing that we will have to talk to visual effects supervisor uh, Rob on tune about later, but I want to bring it up now as well. The Borg ship, as stated before, has a dimension of just over 3,000 meters or 3 kilometers cubed. This was established in TNG, and in first contact, the version was shown to be slightly smaller at 9,000 feet or 2,743 meters, which we can see by the first contact visual scale chart. Okay. Suffi suffice to say, she is huge, however. Wait, Samuel. Are you saying that Star Trek has a problem with scale? Yes, Stuart. Can you believe that? No, I can't. In all my research, I've never discovered this <laughs> problem. Yeah, the Voyager Borg Cube model is actually 3,400 feet, or 1,036 meters cubed, both the first and the last version. While the scale of such a huge ship is difficult, if you watch the episodes of, with Voyager and the Cube together and compare it to that of seen in TNG, you can see she is smaller. It's just that Voyager is a smaller ship, so it's less obvious. Uh, and now comes the question as to what is canon. We see the cubes in Voyager, and we know their size. This makes that size canon. But cubes are meant to be 3,000 meters. So what does this mean? Well, it means that they scaled the Borg cube design independently as to get the best shots in Voyager and never thought anyone like Trek Yards would come along and analyze the minutia that much. Don't know why they didn't expect that, but they didn't. Speaking of, why do you do this, guys? Because we can, and we want to bring new info to the fans, kind of get it all compiled into one place and have everybody enjoy it. You guys are awesome. We got the official Borg drone seal of approval. <laughs> so there are two ways of looking at it. Either the scales are wrong, or there are multiple variants of the Borg cube, different purposes, different ages, different reasons. The fact that the design changed over the years with a bigger budget means that in the universe, ships we see may also be different. And we think that is the most likely explanation, although we can say that the ball tactical cube is the 1000 meters, and given that Voyager is her only appearance, that that small size cube is definitive, for at least that version. So the facts are there you go, and you can make up your own mind according. So, Manu, what did you think of the board cube design? It's just a big square, or do you think there's more to it than that? Being a drone and all, can you can appreciate it on a different level? I've actually been thinking about the the, the design inside the Hellraiser cube this whole time. Um, because the, the rest was just numbers and measurements and, and lights and polygons. and uh, It's much more interesting to figure out what's going on in hell. Um, I... I is is there just a big square or is there more to it than that there there's much more to it than that Stuart there's much more to it than that yeah I mean uh, my answer is that it's terrifying a giant cube in space it's more terror you know actually any poly whatever shape that you choose whether it's a, a, a triangle or a, a an octagon uh, but the cube, there's something, it's the simplicity of it, I think. It's the simplicity of it. And at the same time, since we've just told the fans about all the detail of what's going on in there and the thousands of drones and how these ships work, it, it's the simplicity of the design that, that I think is the most terrifying about it. Um, and then beneath the surface of it, uh, how, how scary uh, the detail is. Yeah, I mean, I've always loved the cube design. I mean, I I obviously been brought up with this stuff, so it's always part of my psyche. But I mean, certainly the first contact drones are the most zombie-like. There is certainly some some fright there. But I think you're right. I mean, simplicity is is the key there. But not just that. You you look at a Federation ship or a Romulan, you can sort of. I mean, we do that 
every week. We analyze, we try and dissect. You look at a Borg ship, I mean, you're, you don't know which way is up, if there's an up. You don't know where a central place is, you don't know where the engines are. You can't analyze anything. All you know is that it's there, you know it's better than you, it's stronger than you. Every single thing on there wants to assimilate and, and, and absorb you. It, it's just this like wave of, of, of not even death, it's a wave of undeath. You know, it's 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 a, it's a swarm of zombies, in a sense that you, I mean that that is that is frightening, and and I'm glad how they evolved. Obviously, in Voyager, they became less strong, and there's you know, whatever transpaced torpedoes. But I think at their core, a cube is still you would never want to see a cube in any situation ever, except no. a teeny one Fact. that you can throw around. Yeah, I mean the whole time that we've been speaking, this shot in my mind, and we've seen this shot a hundred thousand times in the different series. But just the Borg cube coming out of deep space, settling in front of the ship, or three of them. Uh, but that 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 iconic image, and then hearing that voice um, is terrifying. It's definitely, definitely. Yeah, like that's one thing that always impressed me about this ship is it's so faceless. You hear the voice, you don't have a, a, a person on the view screen. You got a ship and this echoey voice and just it's it's menacing it's threatening and it's i, I kind of thought when i first saw it i was like oh that's kind of the easy way out but I, I understand why they did it it makes it very intimidating and something that isn't understood so yeah absolutely and i don't want to talk to you separately about this manu on a separate actual interview about um about this but uh, when i see the board i've done a bit of research obviously watching episodes you mentioned scary you know those, those internal borg sets when on screen they look all the blinkies, all the darkness, I mean, it looks scary. I mean, was there any sense of this is a creepy sort of environment or was it so much of a film set that it lost that charm, I guess? It was creepy. It was, it, I mean, they, they had, they've got the, the fog going and they've got the actual extras, but when you're, you know, in your actor place and you, you're, you believe you're there and you're, 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 you know, actually putting yourself in that situation, walking by, extras in Borg outfits in their alcoves wondering if they're going to move or not it's very much like walking through a haunted house you know uh, it's mm. it's creepy and every once in a while one of them does you know move their arm or the, the director will tell one of them to do something different um, and it, yeah it's a creepy feeling and, and it, it's, it's got a I've always told people too there's an intense smell inside a Borg cube that's it's because of all the makeup that they reuse over and over again it it's, smells a little bit like death and um and uh what's it called uh mildew taxes death and taxes and mildew so and 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 the fog stuff you know it, it, the more they pump that stuff in there the more you start to smell that stuff too so, and then there's the creepy green light it's very much like walking through a haunted house. It it gives you. It's very easy to be scared for real when you when we shot those sequences because it's a creepy set and there's real people in there that can grab you. That's awesome to hear. I'd like, like thank you for telling us that at the end of this episode. I actually I think that's awesome. So thank you for joining us today, Manu. It was awesome having you here, and uh, we have a Borg drone on our Trek Yards team now, so we are a we, force to be reckoned with. Real treat. Sure. <laughs> uh, so, but he's not just he's not just Echep, he's not just a Borg drone he's also a talented filmmaker and somebody that's got his eye on a prize and we're going to hear about that a little bit right now uh, right now I'm working on a project called The Circuit which is 10 science fiction episodes that all take place in one city called Urbiesa it's got a ton of your favorite actors from Star Trek, Star Wars, Defiance, Game of Thrones etc. in it it's an amazing project. I don't know when this comes out, but if uh, support the Kickstarter if you can. Just go to The Circuit Urbiesa on Kickstarter. If not, go to our website, thecircuitfilm.com, and you can participate in this project and come to the set and collaborate as well. It's the most fan collaborative project in science fiction that's ever been attempted. And I think this episode also summarizes that as as you know go, going forward, you've come on and joined us not just as an interview but as part as as our guest host, and that sort of collaborative. You want to be that collaborative with the fans to make this film, and hopefully you guys have got that feeling from this. So definitely support it. Definitely check out the website, and I can't wait to see it made and see you on another Trekkers episode. And I've also you know hollered at you guys to please come down and and collaborate too if you can make it yeah. out here. 
But speaking of support, you can also support Trek Yards by uh, Patreon, which is a monthly donation scheme, or by trekyards.com. Click the donate button and give what you can to help the running costs and keep the lights on, because I need three lights plus that. So I do need four there lights. Are four oh lights. There, there are four lights. There are actually four lights. lights. One, one's just broken right now. Um, so if you can, please do. Yeah, man, and don't be a square or a cube in this case. Click that subscribe button. Don't forget to like the video and share it around to all your friends and everybody you think on social media that would enjoy it. And by all means, check out the circuit and help out Manu, and uh, let's get some great sci-fi goodness out there. So until next time, guys, we're Team Trek Yards. I'm Captain Foley. I'm Connor Kungs. I'm Borg Boy. Otherwise known as Itchy. Uh -huh. Bye, guys. Uh -huh.